Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Myung Jin and San. Joe Strummer did an interview after the clash broke up. And he described punk music and its fans and bands as verging on Stalinist. There was complete rejection of anything that had happened before uh, punk. Any of the 60s bands, hippie stuff, whatever, gone. If you did any of that stuff, you were ostracized. You had to be an iconoclast. You had to be an anarchist. You had to be willing to be different. So make sure that leather jacket and combat boots and spiky hair doesn't smack of hippies at all. If you did any of that stuff, you were a revisionist. Well, maybe they didn't use the word revisionist. Strummer probably would. It strikes me that Zen is somewhat like the punk rock of Buddhism. It's a little dark. It's a little scary, a little dangerous. Can't always quite understand the words. In uh, Asia, in the same temple, you might have some Vinaya monks and some Sutra monks and some meditation monks all in the same same temple, right? Uh, the Choge order of um, San in Korea, their website is koreanbuddhism.com com or net or whatever it might be they were all in the same building and they just did slightly different things from each other here however the likelihood of there being uh any mixing of you know vinaya monk and zen monk in the same building is I think pretty negligible. I don't think you're gonna see that. Pure Land, chanting the Buddha's name, those guys are right out. They're looking for other help, not self-help. There's a Hwadu, however, that says, who is it that's chanting the Buddha's name? Bodhidharma, of course, first patriarch, about as punk rock a patriarch as you can have, I think. He said, Words, scriptures, letters, don't need them. Just see your true nature. Okay. Fine. You used words to tell me that there, Bodhidharma, so we'll give you a little bit of a gray area. The Buddha said that clinging to rites and rituals is a hindrance to becoming awakened. He didn't say rites and rituals are the issue. He said clinging to them was the issue. Bodhidharma didn't say sutras are bad. He said don't for a minute think that that's necessarily going to be what provides you with awakening. 
He didn't say it wouldn't, but don't count on it. Don't think that's something you have to, you know, rely on, guaranteed. I'm going to chant the Heart Sutra a hundred thousand times, and man, I am there. I'll show you. And then it's one of those things where what we think we have, what we think we can rely on that's going to accomplish something, sometimes I'm not even sure we know what it is that we're expecting things to accomplish, they turn out to be, uh, just can't quite rely on them. They're not going to do the job for you. They're as useful as a czar or an orchestra conductor. Just not going to see your true nature because you listen to the czar or follow the conductor. How's that, Robert? Is that good? <laughs> uh... Linji said, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. If you meet the patriarchs, kill the patriarchs. If you meet arhats, kill arhats. If you meet your parents, kill your parents. If you meet your relatives, kill your relatives. Then for the first time, you will see the truth. And that's that whole quote, not just the, if you see the Buddha, kill the Buddha, which is pretty much all you ever hear and it's you know a little bit more soviet than the entire quote is but the idea is that if you think you can count on these things don't bet on it Zen practice can be very difficult. Zen practice can be very easy, depending on which member of the Pong family you ask, I suppose. Zen practice is asking for Mozart and getting Stravinsky, wanting the Beach Boys and getting Perubu. Expecting Huang Bo and then Thich Nhat Hanh shows up. You want Nat King Cole, you get John Coltrane. Anything we can do to, you know, poke it a little bit, say, yeah, no. <laughs> um, and it's uncomfortable. And after a while, that discomfort becomes, if not palatable, at least not threatening. Of course, let's see, it becomes uncomfortable. It becomes dangerous. It becomes a threat. Oh, kind of like Dukkha. Yeah, right. Okay, now I remember. That first noble truth. Samsara is nirvana. We can repeat that as many times as we want as Zen practitioners, and yet there's that thing that says, mm, I don't know, I'm really hoping that nirvana is a whole lot better than this samsara stuff because, you know, I'd really like a little bit of release. <sighs> but we still say samsara is nirvana as if we believe it, and, uh, you know, some do believe it. Some say, Pfft. yeah, so? They're just ideas. 
What's for dinner? It's easy for us to cling to our habits. Everything from chanting the Heart Sutra to brushing our teeth to going to bed at a particular time, it takes a lot of the effort out, right? Here, we used to start our services with the um, Bodhisattva vows all the time. Recently, we decided to start with the Pali Refuge chant. And now we save the Bodhisattva vows to the end. The service that we'd been doing had been a lot like the service that my teacher ran. And it was sort of like, oh, I didn't have to think about it. I just did these things and they were in this order and it was all good. And it becomes a little too comfortable at a, after a while. It becomes, it's like Kleenex, you know, there's this thing, you blow your nose in it, it's got some other name, but we call it Kleenex because that's just what involves the least amount of effort on our part. There's a lot of things that we do um, in this Sangha and Zen practice in general that deserve to be changed, have earned the right to be changed. The Trotskyist versus Stalinist approach, perpetual revolution, that's what Zen has to be, constantly moving. As soon as you think it's this, no, it's that. We've got to pay attention. That's the key element to our practice is paying attention. Some people call it mindfulness. That's fine, although mindfulness has sort of assumed those Kleenex-like dimensions. It's like, yeah, there's this thing, and I blow my nose in it, or I, I don't know, count to 20 with my eyes closed or something. And we don't even really know what it is anymore, but uh, yeah, it's mindfulness. I'll do a mindfulness thing. We got to pay attention though, whether it's on the cushion, chanting, bowing, doing kung ans, huadu, whatever it is, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. Going down the aisle of the grocery store, pay attention, pay attention. Going in the car park, Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. Driving down the road, please pay attention, pay attention. When we take the time to focus on what is really here, really right now, then we have a chance at helping all beings, helping each other, holding the doors open for somebody, asking what floor they want in an elevator when their hands are full. We're paying attention, we ask, we push the button. If we're not paying attention, there's this guy with the packages that's trying to hit a button with his elbow and we're just totally ignorant about it.
We just don't notice because we're not paying attention. We Westerners can be very defensive, I think, about um, Zen and Buddhism in general. Most of us are converts. And there's this thing called the zeal of the convert. And that's a dangerous thing because that's where we start clinging to the rites and rituals. We start clinging to the words and letters. We start clinging to Shikantaza versus Kongans versus Wadu and which one is better and which one is worse and which one is right and which one is wrong. And we'll defend them to the non-death. And we'll say it is non-death because we're good Zenis. But all of these things that we habitually do take us a step back from right here, right now. What is this? There's a laptop screen in front of me and a microphone. Some people in little squares on my screen. Don't be too zealous of a convert. Lighten up. None of that stuff that we cling to means anything. It's all just concepts. What we need to do is have the zeal of the sentient being. Zeal of a person who's actually engaged with their life and the lives of those around them and even the lives of those that aren't specifically geographically around them. You have to pay attention. Have the zeal of the engaged human being. 